Hi, we're going to talk a bit about curriculum planning. There's quite a bit in this webinar. I'm going to do my best to keep it as short as possible. So there are many types of plans uh, that we make for the classroom, various group times, um, what some people call free choice or choice, learning centers, work, uh, your routines, story times, and family engagement. So with a small group, this genuinely is small. Uh, two to six children, uh, two children, three children, closer to infant toddler age. Uh, preschoolers, you can really go up to about six. Anything more than six is no longer considered a small group. These are teacher-led, uh, teacher-coached, supported, facilitated, whatever term you want to use, but these typically um, teachers have a stronger hand in planning and carrying out the experience that children will have. Large group is when six or more children are gathered together. Uh, typically it's a whole class. Uh, there's usually more than one teacher involved or at at least the group time because it's a larger ratio. It's also known as circle time, meeting time, class meeting, lots of terms for what a large group experience might be. We also have learning centers. Uh, these are child-led, often known as free play or work time. This should not be confused with small group. Small group is intentionally teacher-led and this is child-led. Um, there, there should be a variety of interest areas to support the whole child and accommodate multiple learning styles. So I think of this in the um, theater metaphor. I have a little bit of a theater background. And I think of in uh, free time, choice time, whatever you want to call it, the role of the teacher is like a set designer. It's like the backstage folks in a theater where you make sure all the props are there, all the materials they need. You set the environment and the children are the actors. They're the ones on the stage. They take center stage. They're in the lead. They're in charge. Now you might work along. You should work alongside children in these learning centers. And you may often have objectives uh, that you want for the children, but this is not the time where you say, okay, you do this, then do this, then do this, and make this piece of art or this experience. Instead, you set the materials out and then you say, I wonder why you made the choice, or when I work with Play-Doh, sometimes I use this technique, and you might guide and facilitate, but you are much more behind the scenes as a teacher in this time of day. Our routines are so key, and efficiency and preparation are the key. Uh, there's a magic number. Routines should be um, transitions, excuse me, transitions, which can be part of routines, um, should be two minutes or less for best practice. Two minutes or less. Children should not be standing around waiting for two minutes or more. So efficiency and preparation are the key. Oftentimes when teachers struggle with times of day, um, it's related to routines, typically the transition between routine activities. So our meal times can be routines, transitions, greetings in the morning and saying goodbye. Um, our celebrations, like birthday celebrations or any other kind of um ritualistic celebrations that we have throughout the year. And um, our large group time often has routines in it. Now in a lesson plan, you're going to lesson plan your large group separate from lesson planning your routines, but large group often has a routine element to it. Again, many times when teachers struggle, it's because they have not effectively planned their routines so that children can move smoothly and know what's expected of them. So story time is another time of day that you'll plan for, and um, this can be individually, one-on-one -on -one with children, it can be large groups, small groups. Uh, it should be intentional. Sometimes it might be spontaneous, but that shouldn't stop you from being intentional in preparing and planning for this story time uh, because you may be building or you should be building on some other routine or planned events. Should also be interactive. There's a term called dialogic reading and it's about um, 
just that, that word dialogic comes from dialogue. And it's about using books and stories as a launching pad to have a dialogue between you and the child. And so you may read some words and then ask questions or make statements or even just pause for children to, um, for children to share their own thoughts or questions. Uh, dialogic reading can move um, not linearly through a book sometimes, not just page one to two to three and so on and so forth. Sometimes it might jump around. You might go backwards to point out a change in the story or refer back to something else. You might jump forward um, with predictions or to find out a piece of information, etc. So it, it's really dynamic and can be very fluid. It also doesn't have to be just reading a book. Story time um, can include the art of verbal storytelling, um, uh, finger plays about stories, props and prompts that um, felt boards are a great way to do this, puppets. Um, sometimes people make characters on little um, popsicle sticks or tongue depressors to um, illustrate the parts of the story. So it really doesn't have to be just, here's a book, we're going to read it cover to cover, here we go. Uh, I want to take a minute and pause. I'm sitting on a balance ball in my uh, office at, at Head Start, and I realized I'm kind of wiggling around on my balance ball, so I apologize if that is distracting as you watch this. Uh, I am a very active kinesthetic person, and so I um, really like the ball, but I realize it makes me bounce around a lot. Uh, we want to intentionally plan for family engagement as well. So in our curriculum, what are we doing to extend in the family and the home life? So this can be inside the classroom and outside. Sometimes it's hard to get our families into the classroom. They're working. They have a lot going on. And so it can be take-home stuff. It can be come into the classroom and experience this. It might be even simple little things that drop off and pick up where you get a child for two minutes to show their parent their work in the classroom. Uh, this is an important thing that connects the home and the school life. There's many ways families can participate and it should be open to the myriad of ways that parents can and do want to participate. And it helps to support the learning and development of both child and parent. So I want you to um, take some time and reflect on something that you wanted to know when you were a child. So what was something you wanted to know about? Why was it important to you? What did you do to find out? What did you learn? How is this similar or different from what you did in school? Uh, so I'm gonna ask you to pause this recording and think about these questions and think deeply about them and then think about what your students might wanna know about. So hit pause now. Okay, I hope you hit pause. I'm watching you. Not really. Welcome back. We're going to continue on. Uh, so now we're going to talk about um, the cycle of planning and how it manifests in our evidence-based practices that are responsive and intentional. So I've got here on the screen um, uh, the cycle of planning that we have talked about before, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, what these evidence-based practices are. So first I want you to um, consider this vignette. Um, think about, think of three things the teacher could do to support the child's interest and extend their learning uh, beyond what the teacher has already done in this vignette. So again, you're going to hit pause and then you're going to write down three things and then you're gonna come back. So hit pause now. Okay, again, I'm watching you. You better have hit pause. So in this experience, there are so many ways that the teacher could extend the children's playing. Um, you know, this was a this is a beautiful story of a zoo experience and how it can come back into the classroom. 
and the way that the girls are supported in merging their ideas together that are different um, and, and creating those enclosures. And then the boys, and um, of course they felt frustrated that another child stumbled over it. And how brilliant of Max to go make his sign. Um, so there's literacy and there's spatial awareness and there's math um, and there's science in this. So we hope you came up with three great things that the teacher could do to extend the child's learning. Maybe you even came up with 10 things that the teacher could do. So we want to talk about being intentional. So this last teacher, this vignette we read, was really intentional. So to be intentional is to act purposefully, to carefully consider what you are doing um, in the classroom, what you are bringing into the classroom, what you are saying, acting, how you are doing, how are you carrying out plans to meet the needs of the children. It's a supportive emotional climate at all times. So like the vignette that we, we read, um, when the children are in conflict, the teacher uses it to create relationship and help children learn how to move forward. When there's an accident, the teacher says, this is an opportunity for us to all take part in saying the classroom is safe. She didn't say to the child who stumbled over their blocks, watch where you're going, be careful, walking feet. She did not impose the rules. She charged the children with enforcing the classroom climate that they wanted. Of course, there's engaging materials and intentional um, choice in materials and then quality interactions between children and adults and facilitated by the adults. There are high expectations, um, thoughtful questions. It's a really learning oriented space. Uh, we, of course, have to know all of these things about children in order to create those highest quality environments. We have to think about individual temperament and style and ability in order to have these responsive. We've moved from intentional into responsive classrooms. And then when we're responsive, we get to act intentionally. So uh, think about these powerful interactions. There's a lot on the slide, so feel free to pause it and read through them carefully. But this is all about how we as teachers can be present, connect, and extend children's learning. Of course, there are standards that are set, and I am about to run out of time on this screencast, so I'm gonna pause it here, and then join me back for part two where we will talk about these standards.